You leave school, you get a job, you learn the ropes, you jump somewhere else, you end up staying. And then something big happens, something profound. It doesn't just knock you off course, it puts an end to the professional era that came before and it kicks off your second act. For years and years, I did pretty much the same thing, reporting on money and power for Bloomberg News, which meant I got to write some fun things for our magazine Business Week about billionaires and race, gender, secrets, drugs, and violin-shaped pools. And then came my second act. This, the Business Week show. How do you recreate yourself while being true to who you are? And if you fail in public, how do you begin again? We are gonna try to figure out second acts together tonight. I don't think I know anyone who has gained and lost more financial power and has gained and lost more political power and is able to actually think and talk about it quite like this next guest. John Corzine became the head of Goldman Sachs. He became a US Senator and a governor for New Jersey. He became the head of MF Global for its rise and then its fall. He started a hedge fund and he just closed it. And all of that is to say that this man has way more than just a second act. He's here to talk about it. I'm so glad he is. John Corzine, welcome. Good to be here. You joined Goldman Sachs as a bond trader, a lowly bond trader in 75, 1975. It takes you five years to become a partner, which is essentially joining the really one of the most elite groups on Wall Street. In 1994, you became really the most important person at the most profitable firm in Wall Street history, you know, right as it was preparing to go from a partnership, which it had always been, to a public company, which would, it would become in a few years. What, what did you learn inside Goldman Sachs about about competing with, with rich and with powerful people, and not just competing, but you, you, know, you rose to the top. 1994 was the worst year that the firm had had, I don't know, in the last 25 preceding years. And 35 people dropped out of the partnership when I joined. So it wasn't like, wow, we really love this guy coming in. It really was a turnaround situation which I thought was um, maybe the most important thing I did. And I'm very proud of how the team that I had the honor of leading um, was able to turn that around. And I think we had almost every year that I led the firm something north of, certainly north of 20% returns on capital. And I think two or three of those years north of 30. So you, you spent years pushing your partners to, you know, on the, on the idea of, of taking Goldman public, you win their support, and then before the IPO, over Christmas, you go skiing, I think in, uh, I think in Telluride maybe. Your co-leader at the time, Hank Paulson, he worked with colleagues to, I mean, essentially, I think the fair way of saying it is to essentially push you out. One of your colleagues once said, John, you never lost at anything until that moment. What did losing teach you? Well, that's just not, I mean, reality is that's not true. I lost and won many times in life as you proceed. This was a real shock to me, um, but apparently both the process of going public bruised egos and made uh, people who I thought I could count on uh, less secure than I should have. And then we had uh, what was really one of the most important things I did at Goldman Sachs, along with Herb Allison at Merrill Lynch and Bill McDonough at the Federal Reserve. We put together the program that had Wall Street bail out long-term capital, not the taxpayer's money. We had 14 banks that put in don't hold me to the number, I think about three billion, and uh, a number of my partners thought I had overreached. I didn't personally believe I had. I think we served both the public interest, uh, markets, and the interest of Goldman Sachs. 
by taking that on and others disagree. So you tell your aunt, I think you have, you have a couple of aunts, I think, you, you told one of your aunts that you're interested in, in, in uh, there's an opening in the US Senate. And she said to you, John, politics is a dirty game. But you won. Few executives have managed to actually trade in Wall Street for Washington as effectively as you did. I kind of want to ask like a catty, uh, catty superficial question though, which is like, you know, which, which one is sneakier? You know, is there, is there one world where people re really let themselves be known and in the other one, people keep their, keep their motives hidden? Or is it, is it not really quite that simple? I don't think it's that simple, but human nature is fairly consistent. And particularly when you're sitting among ambitious men and women who have good minds, see great opportunities, and sometimes another person is in the way of that person getting to that opportunity. And so uh, probably I was a little naive on that from time to time in my career. Uh, probably a little tougher in politics than I was at Goldman Sachs about those kinds of issues. So if Goldman was first, politics was second, your third act was a brokerage called MF Global. I'm gonna give the short obituary of MF Global. So it ended up imploding. It was one of the, the I think one of the biggest bankruptcies in, in American history, I think. You paid 5 million bucks to settle uh, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission uh, accusations. They, they, they said that you had a role in the unlawful use of nearly a billion dollars of customer funds. You did not admit or deny. I don't think that's right. It, I settled on a failure to supervise. Okay, failure to supervise. Um, they had originally accused, they had originally had accusations. They, they, there were accusations all, of all kinds of right, things. Right, right. Okay, so you, you settled those accusations. Um, your experience tends to get lumped in with something different, which is the 2008 global financial crisis, which this was not. But, um, you know, there's, I think there's this anger in America that firms went down, executives just simply move on, and I think it's fair to say that people on the right and people on the left have, have craved a certain kind of punishment for, for failure on, on Wall Street. What, what, can you, what can you say to them? Well, I think that if people break the law and do it with intent, I think both of those things are important ingredients, then I think they should be held accountable as anyone else would be and I think there needs to be a equality of how people are treated in front of the law. And I think that the issue of breaking the law was pretty well handled by the facts, not by how it was written, not by how other people want to categorize it. So I, it's probably one of the greatest disappointments in my life. It's not the greatest sadness of my life, but the greatest disappointment. Because other people were hurt, and other people's integrity was challenged, not just mine, who I think much of which was unfair. And yet, John, the story of Wall Street is a story of rises and falls and rises and falls, and you pick yourself up, a few years go by, you start a new hedge fund, it's called JDCJSC, which is using your initials and, and, and your son's. This year, three, I think it's fair to call them sort of critics, John Corzine critics, they tried to essentially get you banned from futures trading. My understanding is you think they were just absolutely wrong on the facts. They um, were. And yet, you decided to close your hedge fund. Why did you do it? And wh wh what was it like to say goodbye to, uh, to, to this act of your life? Well, I don't, I don't think I'm saying goodbye. I'm starting a family office, which significant part of my hedge fund was funds for my family. Mm -hmm. um, I'm 76 years old, you know, a little old. Uh, and I do believe that to be as successful as one needs to be in the world of hedge funds going forward, you're going to have to have a footprint in the quantitative side of the business. I think the highest probability of success will come with those that build out A, a team, but B, have access at computing power in a world of AI and all of the other elements, many of which are already practiced in the financial world. World changed dramatically from when 
I was reasonably successful as a trader in the 80s and early 90s to where the world is today. The people you're competing against, they're letting their computer programs, which they've spent enormous amount of intellectual horsepower to build, do that. And I think it's very hard to compete against. I want to ask about someone you know, uh, Goldman Sachs Chief Executive Officer, David Solomon. He has faced, you know, without piling on, declining profits and I think it's fair to call it very loud grumbling from colleagues over, over the past year or two. You are, um, you know, it's, this is putting a very fine point on it, but you're the last guy to lose the top job at Goldman uh, uh, amid kind of general infighting, as it were. How should Solomon handle it? Maybe, maybe differently than you did. Well, first of all, I think David is handling it pretty damn well. Last time I saw him on camera. He looked straight at the camera and said, these things I've done well and these things I have to improve on. And I believe in our team and I believe in our purpose as a client-driven firm. You know, I know he's a smart guy. Historically, the firm always thought the trading businesses were cyclical and would end up undermining the P-E ratio. Well, now the world sort of decided that's true of investment banking too, and mergers and acquisitions. And so, you know, the two greatest strengths of the firm have gone through difficult periods between COVID and the changing view about M&A in particular, but investment banking and fees have come down. So I, I you know, I think he has done uh, a very good job of saying, I'm not so sure that one strategic tack we've taken is where we ought to be placing our chips. And that's, a, that's, that's an important thing for a CEO to do. I think before you go, I want to ask you I, either, either my toughest question or maybe, maybe this is the softest question of all, which is that, you know, what, what you want to be remembered for, which of these acts that we've talked about. I'm, I'm imagining that maybe you might have a fear that MF Global will, will overshadow the rest. Is there something that you want to be remembered for, John? I have um, eight grandchildren. I'm more interested in what they think of me and what they know about what my values are and what they can build into their own lives and see them successful. John Corzine, thank you so much for being here. Loved it. Good to be here. Uh, I think I mostly enjoyed it, Max. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take Good. it. Good. <laughs>
Because people are coming to see you. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't realize DJs actually command audiences. Right. And I have become a global DJ. So I'm very lucky to be able to play in front of all these different people from all around the world in all these different countries, which I love playing to different crowds, different languages, different cultures. And luckily, I'm still able to draw a lot of I people. Hear you. And if I'm headlining a festival, surely I'm going to be making the, you know, more than the other artists or equal to with the other co-headliners. So, and that could be two, three, four, five, even 600,000. You know, one universal second act that I think most of us crave somewhere inside of us is like the, the ability to start from scratch, you know, and begin everything again. You have a nonprofit, the Aoki Foundation. It's working to support, like not beginning again, but age reversal. Yeah. Why would you want to age in reverse like Benjamin Button style? What, what is it about that that appeals well, to you? Okay, so first of all, we can't age in reverse yet, you know, but I would like to. Like, I'm 45 right now, so imagine, so the average life expectancy is 80. Now, I, I've, I'm, you know, with a healthy lifestyle, you can always go, oh yeah, you're gonna extend that. But it's not just about extending, it's about having quality of life, right? So think, if, if I do die at 80, which is the average life expectancy, I, that's only 35 years of life. And at the, like the, the, ten, the main tenet of all this is that I love life. I love living. But well, don't you think you know, like the finiteness of life and the fact that it's only moving in one direction, like isn't, isn't that what makes it valuable? People say that, but 35 more years is, is just not enough time. I think the finite of life, if you live to 200, is different. But 80 is not enough time. Like, I, I mean, I'm just, it's, it's like, perfect example is this. My mom's 80. Average life expectancy is 80. She's like, I don't, like, you know, she wants to live. And I don't want her to die. So, like, the fact that my mom is amenable and open to suggestion of ideas of the things I'm learning through the Aoki Foundation, through meeting scientists and researchers and people in longevity and anti-aging, I'm like, wow, if we try this, the Aoki Foundation's really for her. I wanna give all those, that information to see how long she can extend, and at the same time, you know, I wanna not die at 80, I wanna die with the same kind of vibrancy and energy, you know, much later in life, you know? Reversing is like the, 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 the end goal, right? but we all wanna live optimally, no matter what age. Hearing you talk about your mom, it makes me think about someone close to her, your father. Rocky Aoki was this legendary guy, founded Benihana. You talk about him in your book, he raced speedboats. He fathered, I think, three kids from three women at around the same time, you, you write about. He, he was complicated. He like basically, I think, pled guilty to insider trading. I mean, the United States. He, he was like almost de de deported. He, I think, he even sued like a couple of your siblings, but not you though. What 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 did he teach you that you think about like day in and day out? He he taught me about risks and taking risks for to to increase his like his quality of life was living on the edge. That was that was where he loved to live. And when you see that growing up as a kid, it's like, oh, that's how you're supposed to live. Because everything he did was like, I gotta break this record. Like he was the first one to fly a hot air balloon from Japan to America and almost died doing it. And then he gets out of that, that, that hot air balloon going, what other records can we break? What other things can I do that is not, is not possible? So that was the other thing. The, the risks that he lived, like also I'm an adrenaline junkie and I, and I started doing certain things that put me in that adrenaline, that adrenaline area of my life. And I was like, oh yeah, I get it now. Mm. I get like, wow, this is really, when you're on the edge, it does feel more exciting. There's like, like this adrenaline you feel, the dopamine is definitely there, you know? And then this determination to do things that you might not be skilled enough to do, but you just have to put in the time and, and the passion. And I would say a lot of what has made me who I am is definitely in the same boat. I mean, it's not my job to psychoanalyze you, but it's almost like you maybe subconsciously, like you, you've provided like a second act to your father's life. Like you've provided this level of adrenaline that even he didn't have. Like the kind of things that you're doing now is like the one step beyond like flying a balloon from Japan to America. Has that ever occurred to you that you're like, you're, you're continuing his life kind of? I, I think it, with all of his kids, he's had this incredible effect and impact where we all do that. And you know, I don't want to deflect 
away from myself, but my siblings are like this too. We always have like this urge to, to like, you know, continue this legacy and to make him proud. He was a difficult man to, to make proud of what you're doing. I'm sure. But after he died, it was like, it was like oh, I gotta do this for, for dad. I gotta do this for, you know, like if I could do this, it's like for him. It's not, it's not necessarily for you, it's for him. You've talked about FOMO. I wanna ask you about kind of the opposite of FOMO, which is regret. You've called yourself a crypto believer. And last year, I mean, right before the end of the road for, uh, for Sam Bankman fried you DJed the Crypto Bahamas Festival for FTX. Can you just give me a sense of like how you, how you feel about that now? Yeah, well, obviously, like at that time, it was, uh, it was like, I'm a crypto guy. So I was in Bitcoin, I was in Ethereum, I was big on NFTs. And uh, when I got invited to, to play out there and be out there, it was actually pretty exciting at that time. Um, but, you know, obviously it is regretful that I was even there and I was playing there. But, you know, some of those things you can't, you can't predict what's going to happen. You don't, you don't, I never saw that it was going to go in that direction at all. I remember that time, it was just everyone's affirmations or like thoughts on where crypto was going was to the moon, really. You know, at that time, I thought Bitcoin was going to hit 100,000 for sure. I kept on piling my money in. Even at, at 60 grand, I was putting more money in. Do you still have a lot of NFTs? I know, I think you issued some NFTs, but the market is just like, it's kind of been obliterated. Yeah, it's obliterated. There are like a small core of us that still believe that it's gonna be part of the future. The NFTs and blockchain, first of all, it's a blockchain technology, I think is something that is gonna be underlying in the future. It's, 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 a, it's something you can't really, it's a, it's a great transaction service. You know, a, a place where you can find a decentralized way to, to do transactions and it's secure on the blockchain. I do believe in that. I do, I'm a believer of that. Steve Aoki, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. There are at least two reasons you can be sure that F. Scott Fitzgerald was wrong when he said there's no such thing as a second act in American lives. For one thing, the line itself had a second act. It started out in an essay and it ended up in one of his novels. For another thing, F. Scott Fitzgerald died thinking he was a failure and he ended up in like every bookshelf in America. The careers of our two guests tonight, one of them a scandal-plagued Wall Street executive and the other a globe-trotting electronic music DJ, look about as different as physically possible. And yet, they both show you can start and stop and start again and change. Some of that has to do with privilege and luck, popular opinion, forgiveness, grace, and part of it is up to you, who you were, who you are, and who you want to be. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I won't get you, I won't get you. I have a very passionate dislike of disloyalty. Do you want to, uh, you want to have any words for the cake? Or no, it's just, it's just time to get caked. Most important lesson I've learned from business is hire the very best people. They'll make you look good. You ready? Should I cake from back here? Yeah, go for it. Okay, I need, I'm left-handed, so I'm gonna have to like, here, sit over there. Pork roll or Taylor ham? Taylor ham by a long distance. Ready? Go for it.